under the Controlled Substances Act and Corollary State Law, the growth, trafficking, sale, possession, or consumption of psychedelics may be a felony punishable by imprisonment, fines, forfeiture of property, or some combination thereof. Psychedelic X is for general information only. Information provided on the show does not constitute legal advice, nor does your listening to the show create an attorney-client relationship with the host. Fucking think about it. All right, so this, this is legitimately a protect the police from civil liability policy of theirs. Fascinating. Exactly. Well, so then, there's a principle at stake in that case. And then there's a lot of the time there's a there's another principle, which is cops don't lie. You know, so on any given day. <laughs> right. Sorry to laugh at that. Keep going. No. I, yeah. Right. I, I know. I know. But it's like, look, dude, cops don't lie. So we have to literally catch them in perjury to prove that they do. You know, that's yeah. like how you want. They say we're sneaky. Yes, we're sneaky. Because if we weren't sneaky as criminal defense lawyers, we'd win. Sure. Nothing. <laughs> uh, and uh, let me pause there for a moment. For, for the sake of listeners at home, um, I can tell you from personal experience, having almost 30 years as a practicing lawyer, and I'm in court a lot, I have absolutely experienced public officials, um, not just police, but other like, you know, investigators and uh, that type. Um, absolutely lie. They do it. I'm not saying they all do. I'm not even saying it's the majority, but the notion that your job title suddenly renders you immune from human frailty is absurd. Just absurd. Most are good hearted. Most have a, a good sense of, of morals and right and wrong, and they do their jobs competently and well, and God bless them. But there are absolutely some rotten apples in the barrel. Make no mistake. Oh, yeah. And yeah, it's not a matter of having cynicism in um, uh, about public officials in general. Right. I mean, my, you know, the, like the vast majority of the people in my family, um, uh, that I grew up with, you know, who are basically old Arizona Mexican family, they all worked in government. Why? Because it was the place where an educated person of Latino background could get the best shake. You know, they were not going to, get a better shake elsewhere. So for a long time, that was what, so my brother was a prosecutor. My dad was a legislator. My mom worked in the highway patrol, uh, you know, highway department, you know? So yeah, government's great. And I, I, you know, as far as I'm concerned, the great thing is going right now and it's part of the high tide thing. And it's part of seeing that you telling me to my great delight that the, the DEA took the guidance down Biden. Okay. Let's one word Biden. And why Biden? And because Biden knows how to drive government. Yeah. Basically, the concept. When I was a kid, my dad was working in D.C. So so I could be closer to him and more subject to military discipline. He sent me to a military school in Virginia. So that means I got to spend weekends with him in D.C. And, you know, he was proud to be working for the Johnson administration in this thing called the War on Poverty. And I remember him gesturing to the great buildings on Constitution Avenue and, you know, Pennsylvania Avenue and you know, the White House, and you know, saying government is the engine of the economy. And I could see it. It was like the buildings were like big railroad cars and they were being they were pulling the whole country. You know, I could see it. You know? So that's actually a beautiful metaphor. I have never thought about it that way. But um, having visited D.C., yeah, I can absolutely see that. I like that very much. Yeah, I, I, I mean, growing up in D.C., you know, being able to spend three years of three years in military school was a formative experience that, frankly, I could have done without. But <laughs> being around D.C. a lot, you know, it, yeah, it was. And and that was and, and when when Biden won, I said, I'm not worried about how this dude is going to govern because to win like that. That's some old sea captain shit, dude. <laughs> he did. He did real good in the thick of the storm. Yeah. You know, he's like, no, I'm going to stand around there, get whipped around by the wind, get all worn out, making heroic gestures. I'm standing right here in the wheelhouse and keep my eye on shit. Yeah. And well, you got to the, do what they did to do what they did to punch through all those fucking lies, fucking 60 lawsuits. Yeah. That's it. Well, and like when that gets, gets to Washington. Well, obviously, the team said we get to do what we didn't do under Obama. Yeah, let's do it. Okay. 
I'm all right with that. Well, e- even now, for the listeners outside of Arizona, um, we still, months after the election, months after all of these dozens and dozens of lawsuits have resolved in favor of the integrity of the election, we are having what is affectionately termed as the fraud it taking place um, due to our Arizona the Senate. Fraud it. Yes, I love it. Oh. The fraud it. Oh, God. Please tell me uh, that's not the first person. time you've heard that. Am I actually getting credit for that? Oh, man. I mean, I got I, I, I'm going straight to Cafe Press next, you know. Uh, <laughs> You know, it's uh, yeah, I survived the Arizona 2021 fraud. It. Yeah. Um, which is not the only one now. They started it in Arizona, but now this is popping up all over the country. There are private groups yeah. trying to worm their way into their state legislatures and actually getting some traction amongst the Republican dominated legislatures to allow these independent third party amateur audits to take place and this has been making yeah. certainly national yeah, it's like news going up and yeah they're they're painting you know pictures of jehovah on the lenses of the astronomers telescopes you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's it's a disturbing and chilling time i think for democracy but equally true it's also strangely really positive for psychedelics like for for example i know a lot of people were very freaked out and aggrieved at the spate of Supreme Court appointments that Trump got to make. Um, yeah, he absolutely put some very conservative justices on the court. But in a weird way, I think that favors psychedelic religion. So if you can turn a lemon into lemonade, um, that's your lemonade, kids. Well, it's, like, you know, it's at this point, it's a flinking Catholic cabal, you know? Yeah. And, uh you know, and then what, you know, add in Kagan's joke about where she was for Christmas. Uh, did you hear that one? No, no, no. Do tell. Uh, it was in Senate uh, at the Senate. I think Flink and Lindsey Graham asked her where she was going to eat for Christmas because she's Jewish. Yeah. And she says, well, probably like all Jewish people, I'm going to be eating Chinese food. <laughs> yeah. by, by the way, uh, family tradition in my household. <laughs> You know, I was, uh, you know, I worked at Mazursky, Schwartz and Angelo in L.A., but I really never became part of the family. <laughs> you know? well, it was one of those things it's like Judaism. Yeah, it's, that's things the, the really good lawyers do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's the uh, the the lineage I was raised with. But I will tell you on Christmas Day, there's or excuse me, Christmas Eve, rather, um, there is yeah. nothing more tasty than a well-prepared Cantonese egg roll. Sorry. Oh, it doesn't gosh. get better than oh, that. Yeah, and I bet they're I, I bet they're rolling out their best work, so to speak. You know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good lord! Yeah. Well, um. So, but you know, back to uh, back to the lawsuit because I think it's it's worth chatting about a little bit. Yeah. I'd love to go through um some of the uh, elements if you want to. Yeah, um, please. So I'm 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 on the caption right now. Um, absolutely, yes. Please walk us through. And in fact, let me zoom out a little bit just so I can get a little more text on the screen um, as right. we do that. So let me. All right, I've got it. So like I get about eh, three quarters of a page on the screen. So I might have to um, be active in the scrolling as you narrate. But please gu- guide us. And right now, uh, we're okay. on the very, we're on the very Here's- base of the caption. I, you know, because the policy has been taken down, I think it's significant, um, you know, to talk about what it's been doing to us. OK. Um, and so we start out here uh, on page two, looking around line uh, at, at uh, subheading G, the DEA's policy of denying regulatory service to visionary churches. Now, at the heart of this argument, Wait, wait, is, wait, wait, before you go, um, you're saying page two subheading G? Um, page oh, oh two, you're going off the index. Um, okay, I'm sorry. Okay, I, I thought oh, we were yeah, going to scroll I'm through sorry. the actual text. Okay, so just for the audience's sake, we are taking a tour through the index right now. Okay, got it. Right, okay. exactly. So yeah, line two, um, yeah, uh, 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 line 22, page two, DEA's policy of denying regulatory services to visionary churches. That is what the guidance really was. The guidance that has been taken down was what I always said. It was like a painted door on a wall. Looks like a door, but it will never open. 
If you actually try and grasp the handle, you will find that it, 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 it's there, but it's just, it's not going to ever swing out. So it, that's the way the policy was. It was a means of denying regulatory services in a very clever way by saying that they were offering them, but with so many, what I said, poison pills in there, you know, you got to under confess to using control substance, uh, section schedule one controlled substances um, without an exemption um, in order to get one. And it turns out that this was exactly the way the Marijuana Tax Act that Dr. Timothy Leary got invalidated by the Supreme Court yeah. in the 60s. This is exactly the concept behind it. And the Supreme Court said nobody's ever applied for one of these licenses because you would be confessing to, oh, it's not a federal crime. The feds were so cute. They were like, well, it's not a federal crime. It's, yeah, but it's a crime in all 50 states. Yeah. So confess it. And your policy says that the local prosecutors can get the lists of whoever got these. So what you've done is you've been convicting people for not having gotten licenses, which you would have convicted them for getting yeah. if they had gotten you can't Absolutely. do that. They said, no, no, we wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't do that. And they said, yes, yes, yes. It's just like you did it. You did it to the gamblers before in the Marchetti case. And so you cannot simultaneously incentivize and criminally disincentivize making a confession, you know? Yeah. And so that was, uh, that was, you know, that was what we were living with. And um, for the government to have literally backed away from it um, is considerable, um, a, a considerable improvement in the atmosphere that we find ourselves in. Um, because I will point this out in this litigation, in opposition to a motion for preliminary injunction, the United States of America, the attorney general said something that they've never said before which is that after the decision in the Church of the Holy Light of the Queen case and the, and the UDV case, from, but in particular, they, they say the Church of the Holy Light of the Queen case, after that, they can no longer fail to consider a request for exemption. Well, they were always obligated to consider it, considering they invited it. But did they put a timeline on that statement? Well, see, the, the background of CHLQ was that they arrested Jonathan Goldman and seized his 50-gallon or the, the Dimey's 50-gallon drum of ayahuasca after the, UD, after the Dimey had been in communication with the U.S. attorney in an effort to get an exemption. <laughs> so what they're saying now, their position now is, yeah, submit your confession. Yeah. And even after we have, even after we have shown that, um, that, that we are filing a lawsuit in state, you know, we filed a lawsuit instead of submitting the petition for exemption. And in the lawsuit, it says we have all the reasons why. We are not going to submit an exemption, including the Fifth Amendment violation that's uh, that it requires, the Fifth Amendment waiver that it requires. Now, not only, uh, but um, oh, excuse me, I was, I was lost the thread of that discourse. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm sorry, I just lost the thread of that one. No worries. I uh, I'm 52 yeah. now. Occasionally, my thought train will derail. Um. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I got it back. Um, yeah. So the point was that even though we made all these points in the litigation, I write the DOJ lawyer a letter and he says, uh, and he, he I, I say, you know, why are you seizing our imported stuff? You're still seizing our imported stuff. You told the court that you're not seeking to prosecute AYA and which they did, but you are still seizing our medicine. And he writes back to us and says, why don't you submit a request for an exemption? I'm like, Why would what I? about this lawsuit do you not get? Yeah. You know, they actually on paper still take the official position that we should be filing for an exemption. So for me to have them taken it down was like, wow, great. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think the agency's got it backwards. I don't think anybody has to ask permission 
That's not what the First Amendment stands for. And I I don't know if you've encountered this argument yet, but this one's been rolling around in my head for over a year as I try to, you know, resolve this conundrum. I don't see the DEA getting out of this in any capacity because in order for the DEA to be able to say, hey, as an agency with some sort of police authority here, we have an agency obligation to regulate these substances as they regard religious organizations. And we, as that agency, have the right to determine whether or not your organization qualifies or fails to qualify for that exemption. But in order for the DEA to do that, don't they necessarily have to have an institutional definition for what is a religion? And also, don't they have to then have a qualification for what they consider to be an acceptable or unacceptable religious practice? And isn't that terribly far afield of anything in their organic document that that creates the agency? Yes. And of course, the answer to all of those well-stated rhetorical questions is no. And all winds up to the concluding statement. They simply have no jurisdiction. Yeah. Even if the First Amendment permitted such an exercise. Mm -hmm. Which it does not for the listeners at home. (laughs) For sure. Well, you know, my favorite case on this point that makes the point is Cantwell versus Connecticut, um, where the city of Cantwell, or excuse me, the the state of uh, Connecticut had, in any event, there was a government policy that required that um, in this town, if you wanted to distribute a uh, any kind of religious book or sell religious books or take donations, um, then you had to apply and basically get a license as either a charitable or a religious organization. And you had to satisfy an official down at the government building um, with the fact that you were a genuine and you weren't a cheat of some sort. And the court said... He, you just can't do that. You cannot set up an adjudicator of religion. Yeah, that's just insane to think somebody would even contemplate it. And it's interesting because in that case, they're actually trying to adjudicate the legitimacy of the church or charity itself. Now, there is, if we say, but does the government ever get to adjudicate the sincerity of religion? Say, yes, it does. And we can we can count the cases. Yeah. There are, first of all, draft resistor cases. We have conscientious objectors. And we have there the important case of Seeger, where Pete Seeger, being a humanist, said, I couldn't live with myself if I killed someone in, in a war. Um, and the court said, when the draft board that has the authority to adjudicate his sincerity found him to be sincere but not as to a religious matter they were wrong because the deepest held feelings of a folk singer the deepest held moral feelings of a folk singer or any american are equivalent to the religious conscience of a religious person and they have got to be respected under the first amendment so he's a conscientious objector he doesn't have to go to war he gets to be exempt then the second one is people in prison who say, I need an exemption in order to uh, practice my religion, which requires that I only eat kosher food. Yeah. And so that person has a right under the R. Luripa Act. And in that case, the judge can also adjudicate the sincerity. Yeah, and there are definitely examples of that. Um, I mentioned on earlier episodes of the show, it's a little silly, but it's real, um, the Church of the Cosmic Giant Flying Spaghetti Monster. Mm -hmm. Um, For the folks who don't know about it, there is an organization by that name that touts uh, itself as a religion. Um, They call themselves Pastafarians, and there are religion prisoner cases based on this, and I know of at least one where the court adjudicated that to be not a religion but a parody and denied the prisoner the benefits of uh, adhering to that religion. Yes, and and that is exactly it. I mean, I have a, a as, as, as a young woman, I've, I've known since she was a child at UCLA student housing where my children would play with her. And you know, we've kept in contact all these years. She lives in Madison, Wisconsin. She is a pastafarian. But as I said to her, I said, you know, I said, look, I tell you what. Law isn't funny. No, there's no sense of humor in the courts at all, for sure. 
Law is not funny. Law is serious. You want to kill someone and go home and kiss your baby and say good night and sleep with your wife, you need to be a prosecutor. You want to take somebody's house away, you need to be a collection slayer. You want to bring grief all over this word through serious means, you need to be a lawyer. Yeah, that's right. There's nothing funny that goes on here. No. And we don't think it's funny when you make light of our processes. And if you try to trick us by while you mock us, you're going nowhere. Yep. So if you want to accomplish something serious politically or legally through a religion, do not make any jokes totally. about the faith. It's not like you can be humorless. You know, you could be a you know, you could be a funny Jewish rabbi. That's fine. You yeah. know, you can be a whatever. That's another story. It's being a funny person is one thing, but don't make jokes about the faith. This is very serious. Yeah. This is life or death. This is what you do after death, mate. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and the, these are the indicia that when courts are challenged to examine religion, they're going to look for. They're, they're looking for structure, moral principles, um, you know, some sort of a, a body of, of written guidance. Um, well, let's be simple. Let's think about, you know, what do they say? Reach for a cliche. You'll find a legal principle. There are no atheists in foxholes. Ergo, religion. Oh, you want to convince a judge that it's a religion? It's the sort of thing that you would rely upon in a foxhole, Your Honor. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. And, you know, it's saying the sort of thing that, you know, like I say to my people, I say, look, your faith, you are demonstrating courage. You are practicing in the shadow of persecution. I don't even want to think about it. I don't even make a big deal about it. But you are. Maybe they're not going to feed you to the lions, but there are risks and dangers. And we know those dangers exist because you don't tell your boss about what you did this weekend when you went to ceremony. You don't tell even your uncles. I know. Yeah. You don't. Yeah. But the reason is because there could be dangerous repercussions. You sure don't want it to come up in a custody battle to have your spouse accusing you of not being a fit parent because you go to ceremony. Yep. That happens. So it's all these kinds of disabilities that people don't acknowledge that are there, that it takes courage to bear. And people do bear it. And I say, you know what? That is in itself. Judge Banner found it. So when the government said, look, look, they're criminals. They've been practicing in secret even after we seized their stuff and they filed this lawsuit. And the judge said, I don't find that to be criminals. It looks like, you know, looks like bravery to me. Yeah, and, and you know what? That was another vexing thing that bugged me about the DEA's exemption policy, where not only are you filling out the forms, you have to stop your practice until they say it's okay. And don't you think that they will come around and, and if you're actually in trial, have the DEA say, well, how sincere a belief can it be? You stop doing it, <laughs> right? Yeah, exactly. That's <laughs> Yeah, that's exactly. That was, yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah, yeah and it's I, like I wrote in I don't well, know how I, the court I, I, would react to the response, which is, yeah, because you fucking told me to stop. <laughs> you know, does that get what? you off the hook for it? I don't know. It's like, I, what are you going to, are you, I got to ask you, are you going to not go to heaven? You know, says the judge. It's like, you know, are you, did you really lose something here? You know, you might, what does your wife think? Maybe she thinks you're better off without going to these ceremonies. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you you know? know what? This makes me think also, I read an article earlier this week and I think it was right here. No, it was right here in Arizona, in, in Phoenix. Um, the police had arrested a man of the Sikh faith and he was, uh, you know, full blown adherent, full beard, turban, the whole nine yards. Um, I don't know why he was arrested. I don't know why he's in jail, but they, against his will, shaved him, took the beard off. And uh, boy, are they suing now. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And thank goodness uh, Tons and V. Tonvir came out this year. How about that? Yeah. Well, you know, we actually, in our original complaint, we pled a Tans and V. Tonvir tort against a guy named Provoznik, who was Trump's head of diversion control. Um, on the grounds that he'd committed a Tanzir tort by um, 
sending uh, by sending basically by by sending police out to go visit um, Vine of Light Church instead of sending them a cease and desist letter like he sent his soul quest in Ayahuasca Healings. Mm. That was our the hat we hung in on. But so when the, but when they when they moved to stay it, I said, oh, I'll just dismiss it. Who who needs the judge getting in the idea of issuing stays? So I dismissed it. But on the condition, of course, that I could file a new one um, when the Supreme Court decided. So when Tanzan Vitanver was decided, we added in uh, we added in uh, one against the agent at the DEA, a really lower level fellow who worked with the planted tipper to seed Maricopa County with the false information uh, that my client was uh, dealing DMT, which yeah. of course he was not. Yeah. For, for the listeners, um, the Tonzin case is a rather recent U S Supreme court case that stands for the proposition that if you're the victim of uh, religious discrimination by a government agent, not only can you pursue some sort of injunctive relief to have your first amendment rights uh, protected or, or really reinstalled because by that point they've been taken away from you. But in addition to that, you can actually sue for money damages. And this is under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. And for many years, nobody believed there was a implied or express right to pursue money damages under RIFRA. And the Supreme Court confirmed, yep, it's been there all along. So that's a game changer as well for would-be plaintiffs who are, are aggrieved at the hands of religious discrimination by the government. Right. And, um, and, you know, a Tanzer v. Tander tort is, uh, it's worth describing how it's done nowadays because um, um, uh, we've got one of them in the oven already, um, which is that the D uh, in this case, department of Homeland security shows up um, in the neighborhood um, and knocks on the door with a local cop um, and visits uh, with a visionary religion practitioner, starts off the, uh, the visit with a statement like, why are you ordering mescaline on the Internet? Bringing forth a response like, what are you talking about? They sell that cactus at Home Depot. <laughs> and, uh, Which, by the way, is yeah. true, kids. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, yeah, we're talking uh, we're talking to a person who's basically smart here and leads to an hour and a half um, a sit down between these two fellas on the couch, uh, culminating in a you're doing nothing wrong, but you're hanging out with people who are. And you ought to be the first one to tell us about it, because otherwise it wouldn't be so good for you. So there you got completed Tanzer v. Tanzer twerk nice. <laughs> right there. Right there. Yeah. <laughs> By, by the way, on, yeah. on the comment about psychedelic cacti, I uh, share with the audience, I recently learned um, the saguaro cactus, Arizona's grand uh, cactus, mildly psychoactive. It does produce mescaline. Yeah, and this is worth talking about because I think that the community should be aware of the fact that what's going on right now is um, is actually a violation of the Privacy Act. We think about it, which is what they're doing is they're looking at shipments uh, of uh non-controlled substances. Um, they are tracking shipments of Mapacho, Combo, San Pedro. And they are using these and conjuring with the threat of criminal liability, which is entirely bogus. Yeah. You know, you know, it's entirely bogus. They should not be taking away people's San Cedro powder at all any more than they should be seizing bags of poppy seeds. They should not be making lists of people based upon the fact that they are ordering substances that are used in visionary church ceremonies, because obviously that's first amendment activity and that's breach of the privacy act for which any administrative agency can be sued for injunctive relief. Yep. So the, um, that is currently happening. And, and then these Tanzer V Tander fear torts, they're going to go around and they're going to commit them there. I've, 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 there's not, I, I've, I've now talked about to, I believe, yeah, three people. I've talked to three people who have had contact from local law enforcement, DEA or DHS, in an effort to, you know, reduce it to a soundbite to induce people to spy on their co-religionists, which is the Tanzir v. Tanzir torque. Mm-hmm. 
and and the imposition of negative consequences or the threat of negative consequences for the refusal to basically become a government informant, which is outrageous. It's a very dangerous thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. The and nicest of people can be resentful about being ratted out to the DEA. Yeah, and and let me let me uh, do this for the audience's benefit as well. Um, the the Tonson case, uh, the reason that that Charles is mentioning informants, the underlying story of that case was there were a couple of Islamic men who were approached to be informants, and they refused to be informants on on their Islamic uh, cohorts. And as a result, these two gentlemen were put on the no fly list, and some other discriminatory acts were taken against them. Um, simply for refusing to become informants for the FBI. And as a result, they sued, and, and this case went all the way up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, yeah, yeah, that is a discrimination based on their religious persuasion, and you can't coerce them into surrendering their religious identity because you've got some sort of a, a police agency desiring to utilize that status to their police benefit. Right. And so you piggyback that with the Privacy Act fact that they should not even have a list of people based upon their visionary church related activities. Yeah. I mean, come on. Come, uh, come on. I mean, are you you saying, uh, so why is this gal on the list? Um, she gets a monthly shipment of uh, church vestments for altar boys. Oh, I see. Yeah. And uh, that's associated with liberation theology. That's why they're making so many altar boys down in Latin America. Yeah. Oh, I see. Okay, yeah, sure. <laughs> you know, a little CIA interdiction process there. Yeah, you know. I wonder so, if you've got an assembly argument there as well. Uh huh. Oh yeah. There you go. There yeah. you go. Yeah. So I, I I I just see what you've really got is. As, as you know, the principle at stake thing, I, the joke I made the other day, if there's no principle at stake, you can get your fair shake. But if there's a principle at stake, all bets are off. You know, and the principle at stake for the DEA is simple. No administrative agency has ever given up one square inch of legal territory that's they've exercised regulatory authority, except by court order. Yeah. It's yeah. never happened. Yeah, you have to uh, take territory back by force, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. And in this case, like I, I really, uh, you know, we're, you know, we're doing the research to, to and, and thank you very much for letting me know about um, those, uh, those. Have a question about psychedelics and the law? You're welcome to submit them. Please send your questions to admin at psychedelicalex.com. Submission of questions is not an assurance that they will be used on the show. Also, please be aware that neither the submission of a question nor a response creates an attorney-client privilege between you and the show's host, nor does an answer constitute legal advice. Information provided is for general purposes only. If you need legal counsel, you should hire competent counsel in your community. Thank you.